isn't this nice? A change from the usual belligerent types. Hello lovelies, I'm terrible at pimping my stuff, so here I am, pimping my stuff. Please like, subscribe, and most important of all, share, so that people can discover me and all the wonders that I offer. Hello lovelies, I've not been well, uh, brain stuff, obviously you already know about that, but I also caught a stomach bug over the weekend. How, how ironic. I should not get the coronavirus. I took precautions against that on my trip to visit friends. Uh, but then I should get the galloping gut rot <laughs> from something while I was there at the exact same time that everyone's panic buying toilet paper. So yeah, not fun, but uh, I'll give you an update on that later. Why am I dressed like an evil Papa Smurf? Uh, I'm not. I'm referencing a sans culotte from the French Revolution. Uh, because I used my time productively yesterday while laying groaning on the couch <laughs> and <laughs> clutching my poor aching stomach to read through all of Brian Talbot's Grandville series. Now it's Grand V, but I suspect Mr. Talbot being Northern probably uh, intends it to be mispronounced. What is Grandville? Granville or Grand V is his anthropomorphic steampunk detective series. Though it's really more of a steampunk espionage series, I, I would I would say. Now the name of the series, uh, Grand V, comes from Jean Ignace Isidore Gerard, who went under the pen name GG Grand V. He was a Victorian era funny how we call it Victorian even when we're talking about people outside of Britain but he was a Victorian era French caricaturist who drew a lot of images of people as animals and insects and so on sort of draw, drawing out their inner nature as as an animal and portraying them that way that was part of a broader Victorian and even post Victorian and I guess going going back pre Victorian really to the 1700s but there was a long tradition still is in some ways in political caricatures of depicting people as animals or animals as people <laughs> it's comparisons that we draw with animals and people can be quite powerful you can think of the racist caricatures that are done also it can really cut certain people to the quick because we associate certain traits with animals like a, a greedy pig or an argumentative bitch Oh, yeah, that all those all those kind of things, and I, I suspect it had a bit more common currency in the Victorian era, which was also the era of phrenology and so on, where it was thought that you could know something about a person purely because of their appearance, which you know isn't true, but had a bit more common currency at the time. I mean, we're all familiar, I, I would hope, with children's illustrations of the time, uh, Peter Rabbit. All the rest, The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham had its characters as animals, and the, the weasels and the stoats and, and all the rest of it, and, you know, good kindly old gruff badger and all, and all the rest. Uh, Frog and Toad, uh, if you want to go to America, by Arnold LaBelle. Peter Furman's Diary of a Country Rat, amongst others. So th there's this long strand of illustration of people as animals, animals as people, that runs through the literature and the comics and the caricatures and, and everything else. And it's all based on that idea that there is some kind of inner nature that is revealed by our animal self, I guess. Now I, would call, I call this anthropomorphic as opposed to furry to distinguish it from the furry. For whatever reason, a subculture of furry art has developed which is um, much more sexual much more grotesque and has a, an unhealthy uh, fascination for a lot of people. I mean, let your freak flag fly, do whatever you want, you know, it, it's fine. But pe lots of people are going to find furry off-putting. And I'll admit to a certain amount of, of bias here, I don't particularly like furry art, furry characters. I find it extremely off-putting and I blame it for ruining so much good art by helping perpetuate the footer fetish which has uh, spoiled my fun more than once, <laughs> shall we say. But there were 
adult, even erotic anthropomorphic series. There were anthropomorphic series long before furry art came along. Yeah, even adult stuff like Omaha the Cat Dancer or Fritz the Cat. Yeah, before the dark times, before Doug Winger. Now this is by Brian Talbot. Um, you might know him from his work in 2000 AD. Um, most especially his Tour de Force for 2008, which I believe was his work on Nemesis the Warlock back in the day, uh, the Goth Empire arc in Nemesis the Warlock, which was about this uh, culture of aliens that imitated humans. They picked up their radio signals and then they built their society around a sort of caricature of the Victorian era. One of the really early illustrated examples of steampunk, I would say, is his work on the on the Goth Empire in 2000 AD. Of course, Torquemada didn't really cotton to that, and uh, the Termite Empire went to war with the Goths. But Talbot's work really, really came to my attention through that, and then I became aware of his other work, particularly Luther Arkwright. It's one of these perennial, great graphic novels yeah, it stands up alongside Watchmen, for example, or V for Vendetta, and other great things that aren't by Alan Moore, but which are slipping from <laughs> my attention at the moment. If you haven't read Luther Arkwright, go and go and read that. It's a more cocky and trans-dimensional romp with plenty of steampunk and, and other elements. It's it's fantastic. You also might know him from his book Alice in Sunderland. Yeah, he's, he's proud of his proud of his northernness. And he's a very old school left wing person working in comics, like a like a lot of the gr the comic greats are really Alan Moore, Grant Morrison, Brian Talbot. Now, sadly, he's not that prolific, uh, and mostly self publishes his work, which I think slows things down a lot as well. Uh, I wish he produced more work because he's that good. But then, would it be as good if he didn't spend the time on it? Probably not. But this work, Grand V or Granville, as I'm going to call it from now on, in, in respect of Mr. Talbot's northernness. This is more in the anthro tradition of, say, Yuseki Ojimbo, or a kind of um, Sylvanian families as reimagined by Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> so there's sex, there's guns, there's intrigue, there's espionage, all of that kind of thing, all with a, a wonderful Art Nouveau steampunk aesthetic. It, and it's, it's really good. To be honest, I held off on reading it because of my anti-furry bigotry <laughs> but when I finally got around to it yeah it's it's very very good the story is good it laces together some sort of modern conspiracy theories and a lot of commentary on modern society modern politics all of that sort of thing and intermingles it with a sort of Holmesian detective work that ends up with the main character uh, Archie LeBrock uh, a badger detective along with his uh, Ratsy, his his sidekick, the uh, the Watson to his homes, if you will, and it all has that Art Nouveau steampunk aesthetic. Now, in the world, the French Empire under Napoleon managed to conquer Britain and to conquer Russia and became this spanning sort of world empire. Not quite, but 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 almost. And I think that's where the steampunk element comes in. And it is quite well thought out, but then there was an independence movement in Britain that eventually uprisings led to them tearing free of the Napoleonic Empire and setting up for themselves. And Britain in this setting is this very socialist, um, very sort of you know, free workers, citizens sort of thing, as, as was envisioned by a lot of socialist and, and Marxist visionaries at the time. It's interesting, but we don't spend very much time in Britain, unfortunately. I'd like to see that side of the world fleshed out more. What we do see is Archie as as a Brit, um, with all the, the prejudice and hatred towards Brits, who are all seen as dangerous anarchists and potential revolutionaries, spending all his time in Paris, which is known as Grand Vie, in the, set, in the setting. It's also interesting in that the whole anthro side has really been thought through, for example, they make invocations to Noah rather than necessarily God or Jesus, though these, these feature in the whole thing. There are humans, but they were essentially wiped out in a series of pogroms uh, in history uh, due to bias against them from the animal peoples. So their sort of beginning, their creation myth is the flood and not really anything 
before that. So that's fascinating and just goes to show the kind of world building and background that, that has gone into it. And you even see the occasional mythic animal, like a unicorn or a dinosaur, and these sort of fit into that understanding of the world. So that all the backstory is there, it's not necessarily bold as brass and up front, at least to start with, but it's all there and it all hangs together and, and makes a certain sense in, a, in an internal consistency sort of way. And the writing, as with the art, is replete with references and puns. Uh, more on that in a sec. So the art, it's a little bit more simplistic than Talbot's usual style and I didn't necessarily like that so much to start with because one of the really big things that I get from Talbot's work is the sheer amount of detail that he, that he crams into every into every page. Um, if you go through Luther Arkwright you can see it almost every page unless he's making some kind of point by suddenly going simplistic. It's, it's intensely detailed and must be very labour intensive to, to produce. And that's a quality that's often missing from a lot of modern comics I find where they just kind of trace backgrounds from images. I mean, I understand the need for speed and, and, and all the rest of it, but Talbot really goes in on the detail in a lot of his work. But Granville is a lot more simplistic, at least on a, on a kind of surface level. And that level of detail and scale and that sense of getting lost in the pictures in the page only really manifests itself when he takes the time to produce a, a single page effort or the majority of a page effort that's sort of establishing and setting a scene. But it works overall, um, and I think I was being quite unfair. And there are details there often, if you go looking for them, that you can find. And as with the writing, that comes down to puns and references. So if you're familiar with paintings of animals or even, even classical artwork, uh, you'll, you'll find plenty plenty there, plenty of references there. If you're familiar with European comics, particularly French bande dessinée, you'll find lots of references there. Children's books, there, there's loads there. There's references to Cassius Coolidge's you know, dogs playing poker, or dogs playing pool. Um, there's references to Tufty the Squirrel, uh, Richard Scarry, Winnie the Pooh, Paddington Bear. Um, Tintin, Lucky Luke, yeah, I don't want to spoil it for you by, by making all the references obvious, but it, it does bring an extra dimension. And, and the references are meaningful. There's a tendency in a lot of modern work to become, across media, to become overly self-referential, I, th I think, and to put in all these details so that it's a cheap way of getting nerds to buy into what you've done. So, oh, I recognize that, oh, I recognize that. But here it's virtually seamless. It's not just there to make you go, aha, and, and get a little dopamine reward <laughs> for, for spotting something. It's, it's generally part of the scene or the background or, or the main flow of the story itself. It's, just, it's, it's, it's a nod, it's an echo, and it is a little extra bit of pleasure for you, particularly if you're, if you're into the obscure stuff which is being, which is being shown. So if you know your art history or your comics history or you grew up around things like Danger Mouse, Tintin, <laughs> Winnie the Pooh, Wind in the Willows, you'll, you'll get so much more out of it but it's not necessary to enjoy the story and you may even get it subconsciously. Um, and it, it, it does give the, the whole series, uh, you know, appropriately enough, given it's set in Paris, a certain je ne sais quoi. <laughs> a lot of other stuff doesn't. So this this style of art that he's he's employed here, it's slimmed down, it's simpler without that same obsessive attention to detail, but it still has its own charm and does still pack in detail where it's where it needs it. Another thing I was a bit concerned about going into this is that Talbot's style is often quite organic, weirdly even when he's doing machines. That worked really well in the Goth Empire really well because this was aliens imitating yeah, a, a Victorian aesthetic and human technology but the roundedness and the slight organicness made it suitably surreal 
In Luther Arkwright it wasn't necessarily as, a, as appropriate, but given the overall weirdness and the sort of more cocky and nature of it all, it, it still worked. I was worried it wouldn't work here, because the steampunk aesthetic is very much machine-centred. And while the roundedness is still there, it, it works overall because it is one artist with a consistent style. And it's set in places that are grotty and gritty and dirty for much of it where rounding off the edges and making things a little bit filthy, a little bit more fuzzy, you know, makes sense. Plus the Art Nouveau style, which was much more prevalent in France in, in the period than it was in Britain, is more rounded, is more organic, possibly as a reaction to the mechanisation of the world. And so between the dirt and between the Art Nouveau, it softens the blow of Torbett's more rounded, organic, artistic style and, and makes it all work. Now the book series is complete, so you can you can buy the whole lot and you can read them all and there is an overarching storyline between all of them and it, it all hangs together very well. If you're a gamer like me, the people that made 7TV, which is a sort of skirmish game, originally kind of 60 set, they've got a set of rules for doing Granville little type skirmishes and uh, Granville mini miniatures is a thing. So you can go and buy those if you want to. So if you really, really like the books and you like everything else that goes along with it, there's there's plenty out there for you to, to investigate and get into. It'd be interesting to run a sort of um, Palladium Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles almost, but obviously using a different rule system set in this world. And uh, it's got a lot going for it and I, I heartily recommend it. And it certainly made the galloping gut rot a lot more tolerable <laughs> yesterday. So if you made it to the end, what animal do you think I would be? What animal would you be if you were translated into an anthropomorphic type? Not a fursona. Let us be absolutely clear about that. Leave a comment letting me know what you'd be and what you think I'd be, and uh, I'll see you all later. Zang. Rawr, said the grinder as it chewed its way through Alice from the crown of her head all the way down to her toes. It ate the lot of her, unfussy, snout to tail, and cleared its plate. It gnashed its way through her dress, her pinafore, her shoes, and her unmentionables. It chewed her hair, devoured her scalp, gobbled up her arms, wolfed down her legs, gorged itself on her torso, noshed on her skin, and gulped her down without so much as a burp to show for it. In a mani de vieux garçon, moi j'ai pris l'habitude d'agrémenter ma solitude aux accents de cette chanson. Quand je pense à Fernande, je bande, je bande. Quand je pense à Félicie, je bande aussi. Quand je pense à Léonore, mon Dieu, je bande encore. Et quand je pense à Lulu, là je ne bande plus. La bandaison, papa, ça ne se commande. I, I, I don't like to, I, I have, okay, like a lot of you, I hate a lot, you know, <laughs> but I hate with style and creativity. <laughs> yeah!